Throughout the 19th century and all across the United States, brand new settlements popped up along the American landscape as folks migrated west. Whether it be by the creed of manifest destiny, lust for the rumored gold hidden in the hills, or newfound industries dominating the western frontier, bringing jobs in high demand, people from every and all backgrounds had reason to find their home elsewhere. Many of these settlements didn't last more than a few years, and sometimes even less time than that. This was especially true for mining camps and boom towns, communities that dissipated as fast as they were constructed due to a sudden drop in resources. A few settlements lasted for decades, focusing on tourism as the heyday of the Wild West came to a close, but the mythos and allure of the frontier still remained. However, this was a short-term success story, and many of these legacy towns quickly filled with ghosts. And very rarely, you'd see the occasional lingering settlement last into the modern age, with enough ingenuity and widespread attraction to the masses. These types of towns were especially seen post-Civil War, when the country wasn't embroiled by conflict and could focus more on westward expansion. No such town defines this latter sentimentality quite like Nicodemus, Kansas, a settlement of Wild West lore both built and established entirely by African Americans during the Reconstruction period. To understand more about its longevity and surviving the test of time, as well as to shine light onto one of the most fascinating bits of American history, here is a closer look at Nicodemus, the legendary black pioneer town. The origins of Nicodemus, Kansas, located on the eastern border of Graham County, can be traced back to countless causes. The most vital of these was the Homestead Act of 1862, and later, the Civil Rights Act of 1866. The Homestead Act was pretty straightforward at the time. Anyone could stake a claim for 160 acre plots of land, abiding by the condition they remain on the land and develop it over a five year period. At the end of the five-year period, if the land was considered suitable and the homesteader followed the guidelines, it could be purchased for permanent ownership. Of course, like much legislation passed prior to the Reconstruction era, the Homestead Act of 1862 had a few extra stipulations that specifically blocked African Americans and black folks free of enslavement from taking advantage. One of these stipulations was language within the Homestead Act making it exclusive for only free white persons to apply. Not all states abided by all of the act's restrictions, but the most concentrated populations of African Americans were in the South, where most states made it increasingly difficult for black folks to take advantage. And for the few black landowners who did take up the offer, they were met with additional discrimination. African Americans struggled to access credit purchase and transport equipment necessary for land development, in addition to any other resources pertinent to successful homesteading. Luckily, with the abolishment of slavery in 1865, more and more states allowed freed black folks to take advantage of the Homestead Act, but it still wasn't enough to ensure equality across the board. In 1866, the Civil Rights Act was passed to ensure equal protection under the law as well as guaranteed citizenship to anyone born in the U.S. regardless of ethnicity or race. Along with the 14th Amendment, these protections made it so African Americans were eligible for plots of land made available by the Homestead Act. Of course, this didn't immediately solve the discriminatory practices plaguing newly freed black folks from receiving their own land. The Civil Rights Act also failed to protect African Americans from other segregation and intimidation methods, utilized most often in the South. Thus, many black folks desired a new life away from the front lines of the Civil War, and a Southern United States still embroiled with hatred and resentment. Moving West, while a privilege few could capitalize on, was one of the best ways to make an escape into something more promising. Elsewhere in the country, many abolitionists and black leaders 
or finding potential landing spots for migrating African Americans. One such spot was Kansas, a more attractive state for black folks than other southern, westward, or even northern U.S. options. Benjamin Papp Singleton, a successful businessman and loyal activist, took the charge in promoting Kansas as a promising locale for other black folks. With the recent construction of a fully developed railroad network running through the state, accessibility to the Great Plains and the economic benefits of multiple developing settlements really bolstered the potential of Kansas. These attitudes, combined with the growing danger and poor quality of life African Americans faced in the Reconstruction South, made moving west a much easier decision as the 1870s progressed. Escaping further oppression, Kansas was circled on the map by many, and the economic potential of the western frontier was on the cusp of being tapped into by the migrating black community. The official town of Nicodemus started as a coalition on April 18, 1877, in the north central region of Kansas. It was formed by seven Kansans, including six black men and a white land speculator, who is known for his experience in developing settlements. Two of the other six founders, including W.H. Smith and W.R. Hill, entrusted the speculator to help their new town flourish. They voted him both as the treasurer and Nicodemus' first president as well. The others belonging to the coalition had been freed from their enslavement in the South and transplanted to Kansas to kickstart a better life. Not only that, but the six men wanted to take it a step further and create the first ever all-black settlement across the Great Plains and frontier at large. There are two dominating theories regarding the name of the new town. One such theory suggests the moniker is of biblical origins, named after the character called Nicodemus. In the Gospel of John, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, as well as one of the Sanhedrin, a collection of tribunal elders in the land of Israel. He was written to have met with Jesus prior to his crucifixion, as well as maintaining the law that Jesus must be heard before his trial. Nicodemus was also said to be the one who supplied the spices for the embalming of Jesus after his crucifixion and just before his burial. The other theory makes much more sense and revolves around a young prince of African mythology. This prince, named Nicodemus, was said to have been captured into slavery before he was ultimately able to purchase his way back to freedom. The story of Nicodemus shows a much clearer parallel to the history of African Americans in the United States at the time. However, the true origins of the name are still up to debate by some. One of the main founders, W.R. Hill, was selected to choose the town's location. He picked out a 160-acre plot nestled on the northern bank of the Solomon River. The city limits were then surrounded by a township land plot expanding nearly 20,000 acres outside of the town. To gain interest in Nicodemus, Hill and his fellow founder, W.H. Smith, wrote detailed pamphlets explaining the resources and overall benefits of moving to their new settlement. These publications were then mailed to southern towns and African-American neighborhoods, where potential migrating parties were stationed and looking to move west. The readers would often see advertisements for the abundance of game and wild horses, a lack of hostile settlements in a sparsely filled region, and of course, a promised land worthy of untapped farming opportunity. Of course, money was a huge factor in determining who could and couldn't be an initial settler in Nicodemus. A commercial lot for business endeavors cost $75, while residential lots cost $5. It may not sound like much, but it was everything for black folks who were either still recovering from their enslavement or hadn't received equal opportunity due to racial hostilities in the South. Eventually, enough interest was drummed up and Nicodemus saw promising growth from 1877 into 1878. By spring of that year, 600 residents had started calling the black settlement their home. Most of these folks came from Kentucky and more locally, from eastern Kansas. At this point, the town was prepared to elect a new president, 
and John Wayne Niles was made the second leader of Nicodemus. Niles' tenure as colony president was beset with struggles by all members of the town. By the summer of 1878, the resources of Nicodemus started to dwindle, as money was scarce and developing the farmland proved to be an expensive feat. Without plows or horses or other farming equipment, ranchers were forced to use their hands to till and tend to their fields. Without timber or a bounty of woodlands, houses were built with prairie sod rather than logs. To make ends meet, the folks who arrived in Nicodemus with nothing spent hours upon hours on the Great Plains, scavenging for anything of value to trade or sell with neighbors. Leftover bison bones were popular trading pieces, but rarely amounted to much of a profit. Young and able-bodied transplants walked or rode miles away to work for railway companies, but it still wasn't enough to bolster the economy of Nicodemus. When the going got real tough, most of the residents turned elsewhere around North Central Kansas, to private charities or Native American tribes for food and shelter assistance. Luckily, the hardships weren't permanent, and by the end of 1878, help was on the way. Large factions of migrators, all Southern black folk, moved westward from Kentucky and Mississippi to Nicodemus. This time, the new settlers brought with them the resources needed to sustain a new farming town. Horses, plows, the works. If someone in Nicodemus thought of it, the incoming residents brought it. And biggest of all was the influx of cash that entered the economy. With the aforementioned John Niles taking command of the town company, he helped guide Nicodemus from its reliance on the local charities to a self-sustaining community. This way, the burgeoning industries could grow organically, and the way of the people would materialize to their liking. After a few months and into the turn of 1879, the bets made by Niles and company paid off. The businesses started turning a profit, and with more contributing residents, more amenities were made available. Before long, Nicodemus sported two general stores, three churches, a hotel, and a school. The town also started hosting statewide events to support local businesses, hosted mainly by the Grand Independent Benevolent Society of Kansans and Missouri. These included dances, annual celebrations, and elections. All seemed well on the growing streets of Nicodemus, until 1880 saw a halt in its development that would eventually signal a long-term decline for the burgeoning all-black settlement. In the autumn of 1880, Nicodemus hosted an election for a town to be named the county seat of Graham County. Nicodemus was on the ballot, but eventually lost out to the neighboring settlement of Millbrook, Kansas. According to a good portion of Nicodemus residents, the town was simply a transition town. Settlers would arrive and develop as much as they could, but only to sustain them for a far larger move into a larger town. Nicodemus was also falling victim to a string of poor harvests. For the first few years into the 1880s, the crop output didn't quite meet the demand, an issue mostly out of the control of the farmers. Not only that, but the number of commercial lots in town hadn't been utilized by new businesses. The $75 price tag was a bit too high for them all to sell out, and with a string of bad harvests, there was very little motivation for new settlers to take the risk. By 1884, barely 50 residents still called Nicodemus home. Making matters worse was infamous land speculator Henry Miller trifling with the legal aspects of the town. He was adamant the town was never officially declared to have ownership over the land and went as far as to file a lawsuit against the remaining residents. The leaders of Nicodemus were privy to Miller's scheme and eventually rendered his lawsuit useless when the town received its land title in June of 1886. With the distractions of Miller's lawsuit cleared from the town's plate, they could once again focus on a campaign to bring people back to Nicodemus. City officials went to the two newspapers in town, the Western Cyclone and Nicodemus Enterprise, to use their publications as advertisements. 
now targeting populations of any race or ethnicity. The papers highlighted potential businesses, social clubs around town, and the plethora of activities offered by Nicodemus. They even announced a bond sale, totaling $16,000, in hopes to sell enough to bring in a railway company. At the end of 1888, neither Santa Fe, Union Pacific, or the Missouri Pacific Railroad approved of any route construction through Nicodemus, and the plans were folded. And as a result, most of the city planners, leaders, and long-term residents knew the future of Nicodemus wasn't sustainable, packing up and taking their businesses elsewhere. Despite this, however, people who still lived in the surrounding township around Nicodemus and Graham County at large didn't want the community-driven aspects to go away completely. The American Legion, the Masons, and other art clubs still held events around town that brought in outsiders from all over Kansas. The town's biggest celebration, honoring the initial emancipation of slavery in the West Indies, would attract upwards of a thousand attendees. The event reached its heyday in the 1920s, when boxing matches, extravagant parades, and sporting competitions entertained over 2,000 spectators. On the surface, it appeared Nicodemus was showing signs of life again, but when the Roaring Twenties gave way to the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression, the north-central Kansas town was hit hardest. The population fell back to double digits, and they were forced to turn to federal aid for help. With a drastic loss of land, many farmers became tenant farmers, and even more left Nicodemus for new pastures. Due to the Dust Bowl, many decided to forego their usual crops for the more drought-resistant variety. As the decades went on, the population continued to decrease. In 1953, the post office shut down operations, followed by the public school seven years later in 1960. Knowing Nicodemus would never reach its glory days, residents both old and current spent the better part of the 1970s raising the funds to restore and revitalize the dilapidated structures still standing around town. In a twist, the rebuilding efforts turned Nicodemus into a retirement community of sorts. Many older residents who had stopped working returned to the town to live out the remaining years. The annual Emancipation Party was renamed Homecoming, and the people of Nicodemus celebrated their history until most of the longtime residents had died. As of today, much of Nicodemus still stands, and is regarded as the last remaining all-black settlement on the frontier. A few of their historic buildings closed a few years back, as the money to repair them went by the wayside. However, their African Methodist Episcopal Church reopened its doors in 2021. In January of 2022, it was reported that 23 people still live in Nicodemus and its surrounding community. Most of its yearly residents work part-time at the Nicodemus Historical Society, or at the community center. Tourism may be the only trade left in the legendary town of Nicodemus, but its legacy extends far beyond that. It now stands as a symbol of perseverance and hard work by black Americans, who survived a great evil to ascend to a great triumph. The people of Nicodemus will be remembered far into the future, even if the unincorporated community eventually becomes a ghost town. The descendants of those who raised its first flags should be proud of the story they left behind. A story that's not just about them, but rather a story about black America and the longevity of the Western frontier. <laughs>